Thank you. Hello, JSConf Asia. I'm Isaac. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub at Superstructor. I live around here. Uh, you might recognize this as a scene from Middle Earth in Lord of the Rings, more realistically known as New Zealand. It's a beautiful country, so if you have the opportunity, I highly recommend a visit. Most of my recent commercial work has been on a cloud security platform called SMX. Uh, the main product is cloud email security used by the New Zealand government, the Defence Force, and most businesses. So we have JavaScript engines running inside our mail servers that handle the majority of mail flow in the whole country. It's also used by other countries, uh, such as Australia, Japan, India. The average juggler can juggle about three things at a time. Like in this example, but then he still manages to set himself on fire. The most amazing juggler in the world, as a world record, can juggle about 13 things at a time. So that's not really a lot more in the context of things, if you think about 50 or 100 or 1,000. So if we think about this as an analogy for our mental capability as JavaScript programmers, how many things about your program can you think about at any one time? How many parts of your program can you juggle? Most people can think about around seven things at a time. Or if you're a complete genius, maybe 14. But no one can think about 50 or 100. So the basic premise of this talk is that compared to the programs we create, we're all extremely limited in our ability to understand and reason about the software. How can we get to the next level of software creation without exceeding our mental capacities? In this talk, we'll look at what reliability, simplicity, and easiness means, how these things are related to solving the problems on limits, on mental capacity, then go through some code examples in JavaScript to help mitigate these problems in practice. This is a technical talk. If you're a JavaScript programmer, it is based on concepts you already know. Unfortunately, there is no music, robots, or live demonstrations. It's a practical talk on everyday JavaScript. I'm not going to assume you know any of this already. So if you do functional programming, which is going to be discussed in Haskell or Clojure or something similar, this will be quite slow. We might have time for questions at the end, but we'll see how it goes. This talk is not original work. It's borrowing a lot from other languages. And it's based on a 75-year history of work by other people, just reapplying it in the context of JavaScript. I especially want to credit Rich Hickey, the creator of the Clojure programming language, for his explanation of simplicity versus easiness, which I'll summarize in this talk, as I assume some people might not know those definitions that he's talked about. I recommend you look up all of Rich Hickey's talks on YouTube, even though they're not about JavaScript. They will help you become a better programmer. So first, let's establish some common terminology of some important terms. Words mean different things to different people, and there are a few words you'll need to understand. So I do email. Email happens to be something users just expect to work. So the project I'm working on, reliability means that email is actually delivered, that it's delivered quickly, and is accurate. So for me, it's primarily about quality and correctness. For you, reliability might have different meanings, such as software being delivered on time, or controlling the cost of building and maintaining the software, or being able to confidently change the software. In this sense, almost all of us here probably care in one way or another about reliability, and that our software can be trusted in one way or another. If you don't, why not? Can you imagine a better word to start this sentence than simplicity? I can't. We need to build simple systems if we want to build reliable systems. So what does simple actually mean? 
The root of the word simple are sim and plex. That means one fold or braid or twist, or untwisted. What does one braid look like? It looks like no braids. The opposite word is complex. That means braided together or folded, like twisted together. So we need to be able to think about our software in terms of whether it is folded together or not. Simple things might have one dimension, one focus, or one objective. The important word here is the braiding and the interleaving, not the word one. Simple is not about only having one operation or one instance of something. Simple is about that there's no interleaving. So you can think about things in isolation. You can see on the left and right there are the same number of strands. There's four strands. On the left, it is not braided, and on the right, it is. So simple has nothing to do with cardinality. Simplicity is kind of objective. You can actually look at something and see if it's connected to something else or not. So the bad thing about complexity is that if you want to think about a piece of your software and it's braided together with something else, then you also have to think about that other part. And if it's braided together with something else, you start pulling all these parts of your software in just to solve a single problem. You can't think about just one concept or dimension in isolation. Another word we frequently confuse with simple is easy, which in this derivation is from the Latin word adjacent, which means to lie near and be nearby. So there are several meanings that you can take from this. There's the physical meaning of being near, like is something right here, like right beside me? Uh, is it in my toolkit or is it installed on my computer? There's also, is it near to our understanding or is it in our current skill set? The word in this case is about being a familiar concept. As programmers, we're so tremendously self-involved in these two meanings of easy. And we think about this far more than we should instead of thinking about what is simple. Simplicity is not the same as easy. Simplicity is not about your personal abilities, it's not about your convenience, and it's not about your tastes. So the first meaning of easy is this notion of being physically nearby. We care so much about we can NPM install something and get it working in a few seconds. Often we don't think about if the thing we're installing is a giant ball of complexity, just that we can get it right now. This is really easy, but is it good for the reliability of your software? Conversely, if something is simple but it is not easy, then because it is not nearby, then it is within your control to bring it nearby by making it part of your toolkit or installing it. I can't read this because I can't read Chinese. We don't uh, learn Chinese in New Zealand school, unfortunately. Does that make Chinese unreadable? Is Chinese unreadable? No, I just don't know Chinese. So as programmers, we're too fixated on this notion of easy related to familiarity. Like, I can't read that. For this meaning, I don't mean in regards to our limits or mental capacity, as I was talking about earlier. I just literally mean, is it near something I already know? If you want everything to be easy and familiar, you'll never learn anything new, because it cannot be significantly different from what you already know. We also confuse this notion of easy with simple all the time by saying that I like to use some piece of technology in my stack because it is simple, when I actually mean it is easy. Excuse me, I'll just uh, quit that. And when I mean it is easy, I mean it is similar to something I already know. Conversely, to make something you don't know which is simple familiar, all you need to do is learn it. It's totally within your control to make it easy. Then there's the third notion of being easy, which is the most interesting, which is being near to our mental capacity to understand something. Because in this, we're all very similar. How many conceptual balls can you juggle? This makes developers uncomfortable because we're in the field of working and conceptual work. So if we talk about something being outside our mental capacity, it hurts our egos. We all have very similar limitations relative to the complexity of the software we can create. So it's not so embarrassing after all. We all can't juggle like 100 balls. This is the notion of easy you can actually control to great benefit in your software. 
If you're willing to learn some unfamiliar ways to write JavaScript, you can drastically simplify your software, making it easier to understand and ultimately more reliable. We're in the business of producing artifacts for users, but we think so much about the constructs. Does a user look at our source code and say, oh, that's so nice. That JavaScript is just so amazing. Wow. No, users don't care about that. That users care about usability, correctness, performance, and the ability to change the software. These are all attributes of the artifact, not the construct. Complexity is endemic in software because as developers, we're too often thinking, I like this because it's good for me, personally, right now. So we need to start thinking about building software in terms of the complexity of the artifact we produce and give to users, not in terms of the easiness of the construct. So Richard, he revived this archaic word to describe creating complexity. And it means to interleave or entwine or to braid. So when I say something is complexing or is complex, I mean it is braiding things together or is the act of creating complexity. Complexity is bad, so obviously complexing is bad. Just don't do it. I'm proposing that some concepts from functional programming drastically simplify the artifacts we produce. Functional programming covers a wide spectrum of languages. There is no clear, widely accepted definition of functional programming. It's a collection of related features that which work together to form a very useful style. Using some features from functional programming can reduce braiding or complexity, thus making your program easier to understand and increasing reliability. Some features are already widely used in JavaScript. Others require libraries, and some are just not possible due to language constraints. So a different model of programming is object-orientated programming. And this emphasizes the encapsulation of moving parts within classes and object instances. In OO, you bundle up data with methods that operate on the data. Whereas in functional programming, it emphasizes the use of functions to minimize the number of moving parts instead of encapsulating them. In functional programming, you have behavior as functions that operate on the data as arguments and return values. So in O, the central activity is around classes, objects, methods, whereas in functional programming, the central activity is all around functions. So let's finally get into some code. This is valid JavaScript code, albeit not useful. Both 42 and the string hello are values. I think everyone can see that. Values don't change. 42 is always 42. Hello is always hello. Values are also not braided together with anything. So they are simple. And JavaScript, for the primitive types, such as if you add two numbers together or concatenate strings, you always get a new value. It does not modify the original number 40. So 40 plus 2 creates 42 in addition to 40 and 2, or the original string hello. So this is also simple. If we bind the result of an expression, like 40 plus 2, to an identifier, we get an identity referencing a value. So meaning of life is an identity for the value 42. This is also simple. There's no braiding here. Now we have a problem. The meaning of life has changed. Because it has different values over time, the program has been executed. The state of the identifier referencing the value has changed or mutated into something else. So we say the identifier now has state, and that the program is stateful. How would you test this? Unless you step through it in a debugger, you cannot inspect the runtime state of the identifier before it was changed. You can only test the most recent state. State complex values with time. You don't have the ability to get a value independent of time. But this is so easy and familiar. And so many of our programming languages and used by default in JavaScript. A lot of people say state is bad because in threading and multi-core chips, concurrency means you need to use locks. But in this case, it has nothing to do with concurrency. State is complex because it is complexing the software at a fundamental level. The data is what you're operating on to produce a result. Const creates a read-only reference to a value. 
It does not mean the value it holds cannot change, just that the identify referencing value cannot be assigned to a different value. So this is better. For primitive types like numbers and strings, uh, this effectively does provide immutability because you cannot modify those types anyway. This is simple because we're not conflicting values in time. To represent some information using objects as maps for key value records for values is simple because data is just data. This is not braided together with anything. But despite using const for a read-only reference to this map object, objects as values are mutable in JavaScript. This introduces a change of state by setting a new field. So again, this is conflicting time with values and it is complex. A way to get around this in JavaScript is by using a library. You can get immutable data structures in JavaScript um, this way. With an immutable collection, modifying the collection in any way returns a new value. So after the last line here of conf.set, both values persist as separate and isolated values. The set call does not modify the value assigned to the conf reference. Immutable collections are simple because there are no conflicting of values in time. Immutable collections can also be used to do interesting things like time traveling debuggers, which can show the state of values over the entire execution of the program because you never lose any changes. This example is using a library called Immutable from Facebook. There is also a library called Mori from the Clojure community, which is faster, but Immutable is used here as it has more support within the JavaScript ecosystem. So why immutability? What do you have to do if you want to reproduce a bug in production? Or write a new test? Recreate the state of the program at that point in time. Because our software is operating on data, there's a huge amount of state in our programs. State is the source of the majority of complexity. So using immutable references and immutable collections can resolve a massive amount of the complexity in your software. Not only does it make your software easier to understand, for some optimizations that are possible with frameworks like React, it can be something like 50 times faster because of cheap checks to, for changes to the data. But what about memory usage if we keep all these versions of the data around. Modern mutable, immutable collections like the immutable library use a feature called structural sharing. For example, this means that when you add an item to a collection, the original is, has not been changed, but a new value is created with a reference to the original value. And only the new item that has been added is stored in memory. Behind the scenes, the data structures share common data between multiple values. So you don't need to worry that this is costing you a lot of memory or a lot of inefficiency in copying, copying data around in memory. Does anyone know what this is? No? It's magnetic core memory that was used from 1955 until 1975. If you ever wondered where the term core dump for writing memory to a file came from, it was originally used with core memory. Every ring you see is one bit of memory made from iron that had to be placed in that network of wires by hand. Bit by bit, it was woven on a loom. Each bit cost as much as $1. So by that measure, my iPhone has $8 billion of memory. Functional programming was invented in 1956 when this memory was in use. So at that time, it was just too expensive. The only reason we changed locations in memory with mutable references and mutable collections is that we literally had to think about where in memory we would put something and then replace it when we didn't need it anymore because we didn't have enough available memory to use a new place in memory. We don't have anything like these limitations anymore. Memory is plentiful, cheap, and fast. So why are we using language decisions made for obsolete hardware? Let's look at an example that's a bit less trivial than storing simple values. This is a sunflower. The sunflower heads follow the Fibonacci sequence of numbers which is closely related to the golden ratio. 
To get a Fibonacci number, we start with two numbers, one and one. Then each subsequent number is the previous two numbers added together. So the first number is one, the second number is one, then one plus one is two for the third number, and one plus two is three for the fourth number, and so on. This is a function that will get the nth Fibonacci number. So if we want the fifth number, we'd pass five in as the n argument. Not only is this stateful, as variables are changing state, but loops also complex what you're doing with how to do it. In the forward definition, it's checking if i is less than n on each step, and incrementing i, which is the iteration part. And then inside the for loop, the step part is calculating the value. So a loop represents complexing different concerns and is a source of complexity. Could this be written so that it's stateless and not using a loop? It can be written this way. It's not very useful to write it like this, but no variables changing state, and there's no looping. Also, despite having no state, branching complex with structure and organization in the program. So branching is not actually simple. There is a better way. This is a recursive algorithm where fib calls itself until n is less than or equal to two. Then it will return one and stop calling itself. No references change state. New references are introduced with const, but these are recreated every time the function is called. So if you call this function with five as the n value, the lines at the bottom are the calls it will go through until it's just adding ones together. You can test the state of this function at any point simply by calling it with the right value for the n argument. Unfortunately, until recently, JavaScript recursion does not perform as well as there is overhead of creating stacks, a uh, new stack context for every function call. In ES 2015, there is tail call optimization which will make this fast. A tail call is when the very last thing the function does before returning as a recursive call to itself. So this fib function is not optimizable because after calling itself, it calls itself again. So it's doing something else after it calls itself the first time in the return statement. So let's rewrite the recursive fib function slightly so that there is just one recursive call in the return statement. This is now a tail call. The very last thing in the function is doing before returning is calling itself. At this point, why do we need to allocate more stack space? The current invocation of the function will never need the stack space again. As soon as it receives a value from the recursive call, it will return to the caller. So instead of allocating stack space, we could simply reuse the stack space used by the current function invocation and inherit the return address, which will return the Fibonacci number. In the latest JavaScript engines supporting ES 2015, tail call optimizations will make this fast and efficient. So functions have a concept of purity in functional programming. We say a function is impure if it causes state to change outside of the scope of itself. This is also referred to as side effects because there is an e effect outside of the scope of the function. Impure functions are complex because yet again, it is complexing values in time over your program. But you see the style of mutating outer scope variables all the time in JavaScript. Conversely, a pure function only takes arguments and returns values. It does not modify any outer scope state. Pure functions are easy to test in isolation because you only need to provide arguments to test the result. There's not some outer scope state to set up and, and check. And obviously, pure functions don't complete time with values so are simple. So without loops and modifying values, how do you convert one collection of values into another collection of values? One of the most fundamental functions in functional programming is map, which is used to convert one collection into a related one by running the same function against each member of the collection. Any function that takes a function as an argument or returns a function as a return value is known as a higher order function in general. So in this example, 
double is a function that is passed to the map function to run against each number. This is simpler than loops because it does not complete what you are doing with how to do it. I put simpler with an R here because it's not as simple as it could be. First, I could be using immutable collections instead of the JavaScript mutable arrays and maps. Second, I'll talk later about how common collection functions like map complete the inputs and the outputs of the data with the steps or transformations you're performing on the data. Reduce is a more general higher order function for collections than map. It allows you to produce any new value from a collection. So each invocation of the add function receives the value so far and returns the new value that would be passed into the next invocation of the add function. In this way, a value is built up over each member of the collection. Filter is another example of a common higher order function for collections. It will produce a new collection with any items that do not pass a truth test removed. The isEven function will be invoked for each member of the collection. And if it returns false, the member will be removed from the collection returned by the filter function. I want to make special mention of for each here, which is technically a higher order function for collections because it takes a step function as an argument. For each is basically a loop with a step defined as a function because there's no output value. Because there's no output value, the only use it can have is as an impure step function that changes state or has side effects. So the only possible valid use of this is perhaps for debugging or intentional side effects if you can't do it another way. It is definitely simpler to use reduce, filter, map, or similar functions uh, for working with transforming collections. So this is complex. Methods are actually like stateful functions most of the time. But even if methods on classes and instances do not mutate any state, object orientation complex a lot of things. It complex state, identity, values, Methods complete functions, state, and namespaces. This is claimed to re be required to encapsulate the data with its implementation. But latitude and longitude here in this example are just data. What implementation do they actually have? In reality, this is braiding together the operations on the data with the data itself. Object orientation in general is very complex. I agree with uh, GK Lee who, earlier who said that classes are not necessarily always bad. It's how you use them. It's just the most common use of classes for encapsulating data is promoted as good practice as part of object-orientated programming. But I think this is obsolete and complex. Why not just use data as values and namespaces of pure functions? This is easier to test and easier to reason about. This is simple because there's no conflicting of state, identity, values, and namespaces like with object orientation. There's a, also a feature in functional programming called currying. Unfortunately, it's not as yummy as uh, curry in real life, but it was very useful. It's named after the person who created it from a different programming language. So the naming has no relation whatsoever to what it actually does. Currying is the process of converting functions that take more than one argument into ones that, when supplied with fewer the arguments than they require, will return new functions that accept the remaining arguments. So in this example, f is a function that is already has a set uh, a to 1. So that when we call f with 2, we get the result of 1 plus 2. Currying is simple because it enables us to untwist or unbraid supplying arguments from function invocation. So you can do these two things separately. Whereas with normal function invocation, you have to provide all the arguments at call time. Different versions of currying work slightly differently, but in the Ramda library implementation, you can pass any number of arguments at any time to the curried function. 
When the total arguments passed have not reached the required number, you'll get back a new function. If you reach or exceed the number of arguments, you'll get back the final result. Users of more advanced functional languages will insist this is not currying, but something called partial application, that is, partially applying function arguments to the function. But for us, I think this serves the role of currying just fine. Compose is a function that can join functions together into a new function. So in this example, calling f is the same as calling pow, then negate, and then increment on the values. Compose is simple because it enable us, enables us to remove braiding between using the behavior of multiple functions together as a named reference from the actual function invocation. So we can join these functions together and give it a reference and then call it later. This is commonly done in web browsers and JavaScript. We pass callbacks to event handlers um, to do something in rela relation to the mouse moving or someone clicking a button. Passing callbacks to event handlers is complecting the producer and the consumer of events. Because the producer is the uh, document that's firing the mouse move event, and the consumer is the callback. So there's this massive web of direct relationships between the things that produce events and the listeners. It creates fragmented logic that's difficult to reason about or control the flow of. It's also complecting the asynchronous or synchronous nature of the event source with the consumer logic. The consumer logic is directly bound to the asynchronousity. So this is complex. Communicating sequential processes, or CSP for short, is a model that debraids event producers from event consumers and allows intermediary transformations as functions. It was originally introduced in the Go language, then ported to Clojure, and then ported to JavaScript. This allows you not to be concerned about the source of data or if it is asynchronous or synchronous. These are basically multi-reader, multi-writer message queues. So you can pass the endpoints around as values, put uh, events onto the endpoints, the inputs, do some logic or transformations in between, and take events out. I'm not going to go through CSP in detail, as that would be a whole talk in itself, but I'll provide a short example. This function, given a DOM element, a name of an event type, and a CSP channel will put the DOM events onto the CSP channel. So this is an event producer. So for this example, I'm going to use mouse events. So we can filter to only consume mouse events that are on even pixels on the page. Then I don't want to deal with this complex event object are just like a simple vector of the x and y coordinates. So we can use a mapping function to transform each event into an array. Finally, I can use a recursive loop to take events from the CSP channel. So this is an event consumer and print them to the JavaScript console. So you can see that as a mouse would be moving around on the screen, each filtered and transformed event would be printed to the console. This is probably more lines of code than the event callback example, but it's about the lack of interleaving, being able to understand and test these things in isolation, not the number of lines of code. In real life, if we want to take some luggage that is going on or off a plane, remove the bags that contain bombs, because bombs are not cool, then label the bags with a barcode, removing bombs is like a filter function. And applying labels is like the mapping function. You're transforming the bag by putting a label on it. In real life, the instructions for removing bombs containing, um, or bomb containing bags 
and labeling bags with barcodes don't care about if the bags come from a conveyor belt or a trailer. The bomb dog doesn't say, oh man, that bag came from a trailer and I'm only used to conveyor belts, so I just don't know what to do with that. The collection functions like map, reduce, and filter that I showed earlier actually have some remaining complexity in that they're tightly interleaved with the type of input and outputs. For example, I might expect to get data synchronously from an array and provide results as an array. Then I, but what if I want to get data asynchronously from a CSP channel and provide results as an array? Then I have to rewrite all my code again because the input has changed. And then again for every possible combination of inputs and outputs. So there are these things invented by Rich Hickey and Clojure that were subsequently ported to JavaScript called transducers. A transducer is a function that can operate on data collections or streams independent of the types of the sources and outputs. They specify only the transformation in terms of a single element. They don't care where it comes from or where it goes. I'll show some examples, but again, I can't go into them in detail as that would be an entire talk. So you can use transducers with immutable collections from the immutable library that I showed earlier. And much like their original higher order functions I showed earlier, apply some map and filter transformations. So in this example, map and filter are transducers that are composable with the function composition, compose, that I also showed earlier, and the resulting function can be used with any type of inputs and any type of outputs. So you can even reference the exact same code. You don't need to copy and paste it or rewrite it in any way, irrelevant of where, where you're using it. This is quite a high level of abstraction, so it can be difficult to understand at first, but it is extremely simple. We've got into the essence of map and filter, which is to apply a step to transform an item. So yeah, the interesting part is you can use those exact functions that we just used with an immutable collection, even direct references to the same code, to transform an asynchronous CSP channel as well. It doesn't matter that it's asynchronous. It doesn't matter that it's a different data source. So I certainly didn't cover everything, all the possible techniques or concepts within this subject. I hope it has been demonstrated that if you look at JavaScript code objectively, there are simple ways to write things that are not interleaved, and there are complex ways to write things that are braided together. Functional programming features can achieve code more closely tied to the actual problem domain, with straightforward unit testing and easier debugging. Do you want to build a Lego castle, as on the left, or a knitted castle, like on the right? Ask yourself which way is going to help you impact the most positive change in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you. Uh, uh, I just want to ask uh, someone has been asked about RxJS or CSP, which one is better, since they are all like to manipulate the event stream. Uh, so. I have heard of some question. It's also my question, too. Uh, so that's a really good question. The question is, what's the difference between RxJS, like uh, I assume BaconJS and other libraries, and CSP? Um, it's a tough question to answer in a short time, but there are known cases where RxJS doesn't cover um, things where, that you can do in CSP. Um, I'd have to show some code examples to be more clear, but I'm happy to put those up um, with my slides.